Welcome to the second supplementary lecture for lecture 10. This lecture deals with the uh, systematic designation of enzymes using the International Union of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology's Enzyme Commission Numbering System. Um, so the International Union of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology uh, is an organization just like IUPAC. Um, it is associated with IUPAC. Um, and their role is to create standards for nomenclature and uh, designations. And one of the major challenges that they faced um, was naming enzymes. How do you designate enzymes? Of course, there is a attempt at a systematic naming system, but there's so many ways to name enzymes. Uh, it, in the end, it turned out that it was just better to classify them rather than try and uh, uh, defeat the whole naming thing. So gather your handouts, read along with me, and let's go through the classification system uh, developed by the International Union of Biochemists and Molecular Biologists. This is the enzyme subtilisin. It is a protease. It cuts amide bonds. It is a serine protease, um, and that has to do with the structure in the active site. You can see the serine here. You can see a histidine. Behind that, can't quite see it, behind that, there is a glutamic acid. So it's your classic structure of a serine protease. Um, so obviously its name is subtilisin, right? Well, it is known by many names. Uh, there are so many names. There's the subtilisin names here, depending on who's selling it to you and what the organism was. Um, and there's other names. I, 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 as you look at this, I've seen it sold as biopraise. So there's a number of different sort of biopraise uh, trademarks for it. Um, I've seen it used in detergents, laundry detergent, it's, and dishwasher detergent sold as maxitase. Does your detergent have maxitase in it? Maybe you're missing out on the maximum clean. Um, and it's a protease. You can imagine why you'd want to put a protease into a dishwasher detergent. You've got to get all that cooked on protein, like egg and stuff, off of your dishes. You know, if you've got cooked egg cooked onto your dishes, what's hot water going to do? Cook it more. It's not going to dissolve it off, right? You need a protease to help get rid of that. Um, and of course, I use it every day with my contact lenses. Um, and OptiClean contains an ingredient called OptiClean. Um, and apparently it is subtilisin. It is just a protease that's going to take the uh, protein gunk that's building up in your contact lenses and just dissolve it away by chopping it up into small soluble pieces which are easily removed by water. So this enzyme can be known by many names. And of course, in different countries, there would be even more different names for it. So how do we cut across all the different nations, all the different naming systems and languages and come up with a way to designate this enzyme? Uh, well, that was a job that, uh, well, it was a big job. And so how are you going to do it? Well, first of all, uh, Marcel Florkin, who was the president of the International Union of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology in the 1950s, said, enough's enough. We got to crack this nut. Uh, let's appoint a commission, the Enzyme Commission. And the Enzyme Commission decided on a system for classifying these enzymes. Now, if you look at this enzyme, it is a hydrolase. So... Class three is enzymes that do hydrolysis reactions, that add water across a single bond and cut it. And there's so many enzymes that do this, they decided that they deserve their own class. So it's got its own class, class number three. It's a hydrolase. Within that class, there are many subclasses. Many different things can be hydrolyzed. Is it hydrolyzing an ester? Is it hydrolyzing a phosphate ester? Is it hydrolyzing an amide? Subclass four is for hydrolases that hydrolyze amide bonds. And within that class, there are lots of subclasses as well. Um, how does it hydrolyze the amide bond? If it's using the catalytic triad, it's subclass 21. So it's 3, 4, 21. A hydrolase acts on amides, uses a serine um, protease mechanism, basically uses uh, the catalytic triad. It is a serine protease. That's really what 21 is saying. So if you have an enzyme that starts with these three numbers, 3, 4, and 21, you know that it is a serine protease, that it cuts proteins using the chemistry of the catalytic triad. And what is the catalytic triad? You can see it right here. There is the serine that's going to be your nucleophile in your reaction to uh, add to the carbonyl of the amide group. That's a pretty tough nucleophilic reaction to do. So the, catalytic, so the active site of this enzyme here is going to have to stabilize the intermediate, the tetrahedral intermediate for, from the addition 
of that serine to the amide carbonyl, but it's also going to have to activate that oxygen on that serine to be a good nucleophile, and the base histidine does that. Histidine can take the proton off of that alcohol as it attacks, acting as a general base. But histidine's not quite basic enough, so it needs to be amped up. So hydrogen bonding it to a negatively charged uh, aspartic acid or a glutamic acid in this case, aspartic acid in trypsin and chymotrypsin, glutamic acid here, um, will make the uh, histidine more basic and help it to pull the proton off as we attack the protein. So this particular chemistry is what number 21 is for. Now there's lots of enzymes that have this chemistry and subtilicin is number 62 on that list. I think trypsin is number four on that list. Trypsin would be 3.4.21.4. Um, so there is the complete classification of subtilicin. Hydrolase, acts on amides, uses the serine protease mechanism, number 62 on that list. Anything that has these numbers catalyzes uh, the reaction of subtilicin. Um, so there are six classes and the decision was made to classify enzymes based on the reactions they did. Um, and the IUMB, BMB decided on six different reactions. Now, why six? Could you not have had more? Yes, of course. Uh, but this is what the uh, Enzyme Commission decided. The Enzyme Commission was a group of people appointed by Florkin to come up with this, uh, to do this job. Uh, Leninger, a name you might recognize, uh, was one of the charter members of the Enzyme Commission. And he wrote the book, probably the first like really major successful biochemistry textbook. And to this day, Leninger is still probably, it's probably the standard for a biochemistry textbook. It's a pity it weighs 50 pounds. It's a giant, massive work. Um, and not everyone likes to carry it around, but it's, it's, it really is a fantastic book. And if you ever get your hands on uh, a copy of Leninger from the, say the last five years, it would be a very, very useful book. A uh, little high level for our course, but uh, a great biochemistry book. Um, there's six reactions in the enzyme commission system. Oxidation reduction reactions, transferring groups from one molecule to another. Hydrolysis, adding water across a bond to cut it. Liases, that could add water across a double bond to do an addition reaction or the reverse, an elimination reaction. So liases will catalyze elimination reactions that create a double bond or addition reactions to a double bond. Isomerases, so any enzyme that's involved in the um, molecule being rearranged. And ligases. Ligases are sort of a, a more complicated class. Uh, they are bond forming reactions powered by ATP or basically uh, systems that are powered where, where a, a reaction is driven forward by the uh, simultaneous or uh, stepwise hydrolysis of ATP. It's involved in the reaction. So if you've got ATP directly involved in doing another reaction, uh, not putting a phosphate on, that's a transferase, but the ATP's hydrolysis results in another reaction happening, then that's your ligase. So six classes. Number one, oxidation. Number two, transfer. Number three, hydrolysis, double bonds being made or added to uh, isomerization and ligating, putting things together using the power of ATP. So let's go through these classes in order. Here's a classic um, oxidation reaction catalyzed by a oxidoreductase enzyme, and this is called a dehydrogenase. Often enzymes that are involved in oxidation and reduction, well, since they move hydrogen atoms around, they might often be called a dehydrogenase. Um, should we have called this a dehydrogenase? Well, let's see, there's a hydrogen, there's a hydrogen, two less hydrogens here, they've been removed. Where did they go? There's one with the two electrons and there's the other as a proton. So a dehydrogenase, they were taken away. What if the reverse happened? What if NADH reduced oxaloacetate to produce malate? Same enzyme. But isn't that a hydrogenase then? You're, you're going in the reverse. Well, yes, but we name the enzymes based on at one of the directions. Uh, so if, you know, just pick a direction. In this case, it was named for its dehydrogenase activity. Maybe that's the first activity it saw. If you're using it to catalyze the reverse reaction, it's still named for the dehydrogenase activity. So just pick a direction. Uh, the name will, re will reflect one of the directions of the reaction quite often. Um, that's, that's one of the problems with, with naming. Um, 
one group was looking at the reaction and, and, and was interested in malate being turned into oxaloacetate. Another research group was looking at the reaction of oxaloacetate turning into malate. They might have come up with two different names based on the two different reactions. Uh, so we need a systematic, numeric system to get around this. This is an oxidoreductase, class 1. Within class 1, uh, it is an oxidoreductase where it acts on alcohol groups. Look, that's an alcohol turning into a ketone. Um, within that, number one in that list is for something that acts on alcohol groups and transfers the electrons to NAD. NAD. And within that, number 37 on the list is this enzyme, malate dehydrogenase, acts on malate. So it is an oxidoreductase, it acts on alcohol groups, it puts the electrons onto NAD, and number 37 in the list reacts with malate. So if you have anything that has this number, 11137, you have something that takes electrons from malate, puts them onto NAD to give you oxaloacetate and NADH. Regardless what the name is, this is the reaction that enzyme catalyzes. Transferases, class two. Well, it's a transferase. This one transfers a phosphate group. So the second number is what's being transferred. The third number is generally where it's going to or coming from. So two transferase, seven transfers phosphate groups. Where to, where to? Oxygen, or an alcohol group, I guess, in this case. Number one is an alcohol group. And two, seven, one, one, number one on the list. Number one on the list is an enzyme that transfers phosphate groups to an alcohol. And in this case, it's hexokinase. And you'll see that same numbering in another transferase. This is uh, phosphoglycerate kinase. It is a 2. It transfers phos uh, phosphate groups, so it's a 2.7. That's just the same as the last one. It's 2.7.2. That's a different number because it doesn't go to alcohols. It goes to a carboxylic acid group. We're going to, that phosphate group can go to a carboxylic acid group. And number three on the list. So there's a carboxylic acid group. There's the phosphate group. If you imagine the reaction going in this direction, you have transferred it to a carboxylic acid group. So this is phosphoglycerate. There's the phosphoglycerate kinase. It's named for the reverse direction of the reaction that we see in glycolysis. In glycolysis, we think of it going this way. But the number isn't going to change no matter which direction we're thinking of. 2.7.2.3 is phosphoglycerate kinase. No matter what the name is, any enzyme that catalyzes that exact reaction is 2723. Class 3 is hydrolases. Now, these hydrolyze um, products of condensation reactions, so the reverse of a condensation reaction. So, you know, you have an alcohol here, you had a phosphoric acid, they're condensed together to make a phosphate ester. It's a phosphate diester here. We're going to cut one of these bonds. And there it is. So let's look at this. Three, it's a hydrolase. One, it acts on esters. And of course, phosphate esters are esters. And it acts in the middle of a DNA strand and specifically produces the five prime monophosphate product, meaning that it cleaves this bond up here between the nucleoside and uh, the, the phosphate in the three prime to five prime direction. It doesn't cleave this bond here. It cleaves that bond, not this bond, that bond, not this bond. And look, there it is. So the phosphate ends up on the five prime end. There's other hydrolases that would cleave it so that the phosphate was remaining here, and that was a free oxygen. Uh, that would be a different number, wouldn't it? So this is three hydrolase. One acts on esters. They'll all be 3.1, these uh, restriction enzymes. 3.1.21 acts in the middle. Doesn't take nucleotides off the end. It's an endonuclease. It acts in the middle. And four, number four on the list. And uh, in that particular case, it is E. coli restriction enzyme five. Um, which is a very famous enzyme. These restriction enzymes pretty much enabled you to cut open the plasmids of E. coli, insert genes that you want, you use ligases to zip it back together, and now you've got a plasmid with a gene you want in it. And that kind of genetic editing and gene genetic manipulation created the entire field of, of uh, you know, uh, fermenting up any protein that you want out of bacteria. Um, suddenly, uh, genetic engineering was born. And Arbor, Nathans, and Smith shared the Nobel Prize for this uh, in 1978. It was a major discovery. Um, their, their genetic, uh, I don't know, their genetic powers uh, that they gave to the world uh, have enabled everything right up to CRISPR-Cas9. You know, um, all of that was started with these guys. The idea that you could have an enzyme that could cut DNA in a specific place, always the same place, because these enzymes are sequence specific. And then you could put in a particular gene and then carry on. Um, so very powerful 
uh, technique. And the enzyme is 31214. Now, if you want to add to a double bond to hydrate it, let's say, or subtract, eliminate something to create a double bond, which is this reaction right here. This is enolase, one of the reactions of glycolysis, one of the enzymes of glycolysis. You need a lyase, and a lyase is number four. And it acts on carbon-oxygen bonds. Where is there a carbon-oxygen bond? Oh, look, right there. Look at that alcohol. We're going to eliminate that OH and that H, H2O. There it is, to create a double bond. Do you recall in organic chemistry the idea of eliminating an alcohol group to create an alkene? Well, that is what a lyase does. Or you could do the reverse, add water to that double bond to create this alcohol. So this is a lyase. It acts on carbon-oxygen bonds, and it does a dehydration. There it is. And it's number 11 on that list, and number 11 is the one that acts on 2-phosphoglycerate uh, here. So alcohol to alkene. Elimination. That's a lyase. So number one was oxidation reduction. Number two was group transfer. Number three was hydrolysis, generally cutting things by adding water across. Number four, making double bonds or adding to them. What's number five? Rearranging things, right? Oh, here's another lyase. I got ahead of myself. Four for a lyase. Acts on carbon-oxygen bonds. That's just like we had before. Catalyzes dehydration reactions. That's just what we had before. Number two on the list this time. And that acts with, in this particular case, we react, uh, this is fumarate or fumaric acid and it's being hydrated. So if we can do that, then uh, that reaction is, that's one of the reactions of the Krebs cycle, and it is being catalyzed by an enzyme called fumarase. And that exact number is the number for fumarase. Now, number five, isomerases. Well, if you want to turn glucose, so there's the number two carbon of glucose. Notice it's an alcohol. Number one is an aldehyde. There's fructose from an aldose to a ketose. That's an isomerization. I had to move two protons to do it. So five, of course, it's an isomerase. Three, it does intramolecular redox reactions. It's gonna change the oxidation state of two atoms. You went from a ketone, well, a carbonyl group to an alcohol. That's a reduction. From an alcohol to a carbonyl, that's an oxidation. There's no net oxidation or reduction. The electrons just move to different places within the molecule. Um, but uh, three is that description of that reaction. If we're changing the oxidation states within the molecule, exchanging a few, then it's three. And one is the, for aldose to ketose, ketose to aldose. So there's a number of those, and nine is number nine in the list. So a isomerase for oxidation reactions within the molecule, oxidation reduction reactions, I should say, within the molecule, um, working with aldoses and ketoses, interconverting between aldoses and ketoses, and number nine, specifically for glucose going to fructose and vice versa. Any reaction or any enzyme that catalyzes this reaction is called phosphoglucose isomerase. More specifically, regardless of what you're calling it, it is 5.3.1.9. Now, if you want to make a connection, like, oh, I don't know, let's say we're making the connection between transfer RNA and, a, um, and the uh, amino acid that it's carrying, uh, you need to use a ligase because we're going to make a bond. We're going to make that ester bond using the power of ATP. This is transfer RNA here. It's got a region that's got the anticodon loop. This is what recognizes the uh, genetic code of messenger RNA, and that's in a particular part of the ribosome. And then there's this big sort of spacer part of it all the way up to here, the part that carries the amino acid, and that's going to be in the part of the ribosome that has the machinery for building the growing protein chain. The ribosome is quite a machine. You have a reading section that's entirely separated from the protein synthesis section, and the tool that connects the two is something that matches up with the genetic code at the reading section at the reading site and brings in the amino acid and positions it along this spacer to the protein synthesis site. So we need to take the correct transfer RNA, there's 20 transfer RNAs, and put the correct amino acid on it. So I need an enzyme that does that. So I need a ligase, number six. We're gonna be creating an ester bond using chemical energy. We're going to create a bond between a carbon and an oxygen atom. That's, that's the definition of a, you know, an ester bond has a carbon to oxygen bond. And it is 
going to do this with transfer RNA. So number one, one here in the third subclass is a transfer RNA synthetase. And number nine on the list is valine. Does it with valine, valine, aminoacyl tRNA synthetase. Uh, so number nine is valine. Other numbers for other amino acids. I believe there's 25 numbers here because some of them have been deleted, you know, they or, 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 or involve reactions that don't involve transfer RNA. There's a couple with this in the subclass that don't involve transfer RNA, but 20 of the 25 are the transfer RNA. So let's look at the enzyme that's involved. Look how it wraps this enzyme up. This is valine aminoacyl transfer RNA synthetase 6.1.1.9, this enzyme right here. It recognizes the entire shape of the transfer RNA. Look how it wraps around it. It's recognizing all the details of the structure, at least on the back side. It's certainly recognizing structural details around this end here. And it looks like it's also recognizing the anticodon loop. Not all of them wrap that far down. Some of them are just dealing with the top, but that this has a unique sequence. Every transfer RNA has its own unique sequence. So obviously it's got its, some small structural details and the entire thing has to fit the enzyme like a glove for it to be in a, if this is the valine transfer RNA, it's got to fit all of the valine transfer RNA synthetase. And there's others. This is for isoleucine here. This is isoleucine uh, aminoacyl transfer RNA synthetase. Notice how it, this recognizes more the bottom and the top, but not so much the middle, whereas the valine one does pay a lot of attention to the middle. And here's glutamine. This one does glutamine. Notice how it's mostly focused on sort of one side, the anti-coding loop, the side up, and of course, the amino acid part. Now, all of them, of course, wrap up the end that's gonna hold the amino acid, and that's where the chemistry is gonna happen. And what chemistry happens there? What is this enzyme actually catalyzing? It's catalyzing this chemistry right here. It's going to use ATP. It is a ligase after all. It's going to activate that carboxylic acid group. How do you make an ester out of a carboxylic acid? Well, I just make an acyl chloride, right? And that's a way of activating it. How would we activate things in biochemistry? We make a phosphoric acid and hydride. So notice I didn't transfer a phosphate group to this. I transferred the entire uh, AMP group. So I, I, it's the same as transferring a phosphate. There's the phosphate, no diff, except it came in with this handle. And now that handle is going to hold things there. And that pyrophosphate is ejected and it'll eventually be hydrolyzed just to two inorganic phosphates. And since you're eliminating one product, the reaction is definitely one way. It's going to be driven forward. So now I have this highly activated phosphoric acid and hydride, mixed anhydride. And that carbon there is going to be really easy for a nucleophile to add to. A nucleophile can add to that really easily right there. Let's try and draw that right there is where the nucleophile can add. And because that's a fantastic leaving group. And so you can imagine that the transfer RNA is right there, right? Transfer RNA is just staring at this. And it's got two hydroxyl groups that could be the nucleophile. If you bring an acyl chloride in to a solution that has alcohol in it, you will make an ester. Well, here is something that's very similar. An acyl with a fantastic leaving group, not chloride, but phosphoric acid. That's a fantastic leaving group. So one of these two oxygens will attack. Which one? It just totally depends on how the enzyme has set things up. There's two classes of amino, of, of a aminoacyl transfer RNA synthetases, class one and class two. Class one uh, will put the uh, uh, new amino acid on the number two hydroxyl group. Class two will put the new amino acid on the number three hydroxyl group. Um, and uh, it's just a matter of which one's being used. Um, valine is a class one. The valine uh, transfer RNA synthetase is a class one. So we end up on the number two hydroxyl group. So there, this is the transfer RNA. That's that giant thing. This is just the very tip of it. And we now have an ester and that ester is going to be used to put the amino acid into the growing protein chain. So notice what we did. We hydrolyzed ATP and we made this new bond. So there's no phosphates here. We don't end up with phosphates in the product, but we hydrolyzed ATP and made this new bond. That's the spirit of a ligase. We use chemical energy, ATP going to AMP in that case. That's basically the equivalent of two ATPs. And we made this bond. And that reaction was driven forward in a unidirectional manner. You can imagine the, the driving force for hydrolyzing ATP is a big release in energy. Equilibrium is going to vastly favor the product. So if there is amino acids and ATP around and transfer RNA, you will always be getting loaded transfer RNA.
There's no equilibrium where, where this falls off and produces ATP. We're, we're way downhill from that. This is a one-way reaction. We are going to, uh, if the ingredients are around and the enzymes are around, this will be the fastest reaction in using those ingredients, and we will have be making loaded transfer RNA. And you need loaded transfer RNA to make proteins. And that's what a ligase does, number six. So we have all of those categories. And why are they useful? Well, let's look at a particular metabolic scheme from the uh, Kyoto enzyme um, uh, genome database. It's called KEGG, K-E-G-G. -G. And look at that. So much busyness there, you can't even read it. I'm going to zoom right in. These are a whole bunch of reactions that are involved in nucleotide synthesis. Let's see, where is, there's AMP right there. There's ADP. And uh, so where does AMP come from? Where does ADP come from? Where does the nucleotide come from? It's made from inosine monophosphate, which is made from xanthine monophosphate. Um, so all of these enzymes catalyze the interconversions. And look, that, what's, what do you think this reaction was to go from adenosine to inosine? You don't even know what inosine is, but you know the conversion is a hydrolysis because of that number three, right? The difference between xanthine and uh, inosine is obviously an oxidation because that's number one, right? Oh, look, a ligase. Oh, look, a lyase. Transferases, 2.7, transferring phosphate. So that would probably put phosphates onto, oh, guanosine to guanosine monophosphate. Look at that. Transferring a phosphate group onto guanosine to make guanosine monophosphate. Um, so without having a clue what exactly these enzymes do, I already know the general gist of the reaction if I know the first number. And that's the only thing I need you to know is the first number. I need you to know six numbers. Number two, what's it do? Transfer as a group. Number four, what's it do? It can eliminate uh, a leaving group to make a double bond or add to a double bond. Number six, what's it do? It creates a bond using the power of ATP or another source of chemical power. Um, so know those six numbers. That's what I want you to get out of the six numbers for biochemical reactions. And if you can do that, then you can understand biochemistry. Now, just because an enzyme has the same EC number, doesn't mean it's the same enzyme. It just means that it does the exact same reaction. So for example, carbonic anhydrase, a very important enzyme, very important for getting CO2 into, uh, into your blood and out. Um, obviously, since CO2 is a very important part of oxidative metabolism, we're producing it. It's got to be exhaled. It's got to be converted from carbonic acid into neutral CO2 so it can be gotten out of water and exhaled. We need an enzyme to help that process because it's slow. It's not that slow, but it's too slow for you. It's got to be a lot faster in you. So carbonic anhydrase is an important enzyme, and alpha carbonic anhydrase is the enzyme that we use. But there's two other kinds of carbonic anhydrases in, in bacteria and plants, and they are entirely different. They could not be more different. Look at these enzymes, like the structural differences. They are not related to each other at all, but they do the exact same reaction. And so they have the same EC number. So it's a lyase, number four, and the other three numbers relate to the exact reaction. And if you look at these, look at the structure. This is sort of a, a classic sort of three-layer um, helix sheet, helix arrangement. This, this is a trimer of uh, beta solenoids. That would be the name for this shape here. This is a, a three beta solenoid. And this is something I think that's more like a, I think there's four subunits here and they're kind of a, a mixture of alpha helices and sheets. So this would be sort of a bundle motif. Um, and all of them share the same chemistry though. They all use a zinc to activate a water to add to CO2 or to receive the water that's being taken off of the CO2. And it's a lyase, you know, CO2 has got a carbon oxygen double bond. If I remove water from carbonic acid, I create that carbon oxygen double bond in CO2. And notice how they all have exactly the same chemistry. And that's why they have exactly the same EC number. They all have a zinc that activates water. They hold on to the zinc in different ways. Two of them use three histidines. One of them uses one histidine and a couple of uh, cysteines to do it. But the chemistry is the same. They're all a zinc activating a water. So since these are zinc metallo, um, uh, lyases that act on CO2, they are four, two, one, and then number one on that list. But they're entirely different. 
So an EC number doesn't tell you anything about the structure of the enzyme. You could have the exact same enzyme with the exact same name doing the exact same reaction in two different organisms, and they can have two entirely different genetic heritages. But it does tell us the exact reaction we're talking about. And uh, in one organism, it might be one gene and another organism from a totally different lineage, usually. Like, I mean, I think we're a little different than plants. I look a little different than a plant most of the time. Maybe if I'm watching TV, I might look very plant-like, but I'm not a plant, so I don't have um, uh, a different kind of carbonic anhydrase. I use the animal carbonic anhydrase. All, all animals use this one. So uh, it can be different, but it will have the same EC number. But if you know the first number in the EC system, when you look at like a big diagram of uh, metabolism, you'll have at least the gist of what each reaction does. So as you consider this supplementary lecture, think about these points and be able to quickly interpret any map based on the first number. You don't have to tell me what the reaction is. You just have to tell me it's hydrolysis. Uh, so that's what I want you to get from the EC number. And enjoy our notes on the imperative of the day. We've been going through uh, Chinese liqueurs, and uh, this is a, a nice example of a, uh, a sorghum wheat wine, um, and uh, the tasting notes are on the slides. So um, I hope you enjoyed uh, our exploration of these six reactions of the Enzyme Commission naming system, and get to know those numbers. Have a great day.